Welcome to another session of the Aquinas Lecture Series. I'm glad to see you here today. Our presenter today is Dr. Donald Chafee, and his talk is entitled Comparing Michigan's Charter Schools with Our Traditional Public Schools, Performance and Poverty. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chafee. Because this, um, this program is run by a couple of literature persons of quality, um, I decided to um, do something for them. So notice the alliteration in there just for you. I call it pandering to poets. Sorry, I had to put that in there. I'd like to thank some people, um, neither of whom are here, so maybe I won't. No, I would like to thank, um, publicly though she isn't here, Pamela Dale Whiting, who was the chair of the development committee when I asked for a, uh, a sabbatical a couple, three years ago, I guess it was now when I actually asked. And I did what so many of our students do. Oh, I've got all these neat subjects. Wow, look at this one, this one, this one. And she said, Oh, come on, um, nail it down, and this one looks like the best, and this was the one, uh, the one on charter schools, and it was, uh, it turned out well for me. I had uh, particular reasons for being uh, nervous about it, but she forced me to go in that direction. The other person I'd like to thank is Ed Baylog, who, when I uh, took a year off from teaching to uh, reside over in A.B., I, uh, made sh I asked him if I could delay the sabbatical for a year, and he agreed to it, for which I thank him. And finally, I'd like to thank Glenn Barkin, who gave me a piece of wisdom when I talked about this. Glenn always has, uh, knows about a whole bunch of things. And I told him I was doing charter schools, and I don't know if you remember this, Glenn, but he said, well, I think it's bad policy, but if I had a kid in a, in a bad public school, I think I would look at charter schools as an alternative. Do you remember that? He does, and he did, and that was very good. Um, I'd also like to thank some, uh, a group of people who normally don't get thanks around here, and that's the Department of Education. The State Department of Education people uh, have, a, have a bad reputation, which I guess in some cases they've earned. Um, I can say that since I don't see anybody here from the Department. Are you from the Department of Education? No. Um, <laughs> The, um, they they uh, were very helpful in providing me with the data that I used to uh, generate all the statistics that I'm going to regale you with, and um, they, they were enormously helpful. Um, finally, just a, one prefatory remark, and you'll notice this as I do this. Um, when you do statistics, there's always this hope that you'll come to the great final reckoning and the great final answer. It ain't true. I tell my students that, in fact, what you do is you sift through data and you get results and then you scratch your head even harder and wonder what they all mean. And that's pretty much where I am with this. I have uh, done some sifting, I've looked at the literature, and I would like to know what it all means. And I would love to have you help me along with it. This is uh, the first time I've presented this. I plan to continue presenting it. If you have ideas where to present it, ideas on the content, I would uh, del be delighted to hear you uh, give it. So this is uh, about charter schools, but it's also about uh, ways of evaluating schools. So I've got two threads running through this that uh, go pretty well, well parallel. There are copies of the uh, PowerPoint on your, each one on each table. Um, you can look at it if you want to follow along, if you want to see how much more I have to go. And uh, yeah, check to see when the end of the book is. And um, again, ask questions along the way if you wish. A primer on charter schools, I don't see anybody from education here, so I assume some of you know a little bit about them, and I'm going to give you some basic facts. They are actually called, in the state of Michigan, in case you see something about them, public school academies. They are, in fact, public schools. They are funded by the state, as are public, what I'm going to call public schools. Terminology, I'm going to call them from now on charter schools and public schools. Um, in the uh, language of the Department of Education, they are PSAs and non-PSAs. And uh, I decided not to make you bend your mind to that. It's bad enough that I have to. And there are a couple of charts I stole from them that have that terminology. 
You get a stipend for each student, just like the public schools do, and they are subject to the same laws and, and, and uh, restrictions as public schools. <clears throat> Here's what we have in terms of numbers. There are uh, 233 charter schools, the last report that I got from them, from the State Department of Education charter school people, and they are authorized, every charter school has to be authorized by either a public university or college or by a school district. So the largest authorizers are listed here. The largest and the one that uh, seems to have the biggest program about charter schools is in fact Central Michigan University with 60 of them almost. Bay Mills Community College, and you might well ask, where is, what is Bay Mills? It is a small community college up in the UP that is run by Native Americans. And they have, and, and the, the best I know about them is they have some sort of dispensation about how many charter schools and their uh, ability to charter schools that allows them to do it um, with some sort of impunity. And, and I, it, this is one of the things I was hoping a, an education person would be here to explain to me. The third one is Grand Valley State University, and then it goes down from there. Um, all, you'll see later on when I throw some of the data at you that all of the regional, I think all of the regional universities uh, have, have been authorizers of charter schools. The, 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 the big ones don't. Michigan and Michigan State do not charter any schools. Private universities are not allowed to charter schools. Um, so. The, they are also managed by what, we, what, they are call, what are called educational service providers, either themselves, which is the case in, in 43 of them, which is the largest group, if you put, categorize them that way, the largest individual um, uh, educational service provider is in fact National Heritage Academies, which is local. It, uh, their headquarters are here in Grand Rapids. They are uh, in Michigan and in other states, they're um, uh, for profit, which is an interesting phenomenon. So is the Leona Group, as I understand it. <coughs> and then it goes down. These are the three largest, then the other 233. Uh, there are a lot of smaller educational service providers. So what I'm looking at, the questions, are they better than the public schools? A real basic sort of question. Uh, it's been asked by many people, and, and the answer has been pretty consistent, and I'm going to revisit that whole thing, partly to, to um, validate what other people have said, not that I don't believe them, but to, to look at it with another tool, with a different tool, a different anal tool of analysis. And then hopefully it would help me, um, it's given me some insights, help me understand why uh, the results are what they are. And finally, th this other thread that I'm running through this is how should we measure school performance, and the question is standardized tests, and the answer is that's the best tool we have to measure schools, and th there are lots of problems with standardized tests, which I'm not even going to get close to. That's a completely different issue, but I'm going to take them as they are uh, with warts and all. The literature, there is a substantial literature on charter schools. The big hitter on, uh, on charter schools is a woman by the name of Caroline Hoxby, who, when she did the studies that I am mentioning here, was at Harvard. She has since moved to Stanford, and she works in addition to Stanford. She, uh, as I understand it, is, is also affiliated with the Hoover Institute. She has done all, some huge studies, and I will refer to the results of her study in a second. Uh, very fine economist. It's interesting that most of the people who are doing these kinds of studies, even though it's not economics per se, um, virtually all the people who are doing this work are, are in fact economists, as am I. Um, she did this national study in which she claims that she, she covered 99% of the charter school students in the United States at the time. She also has done two other several other studies, but the two most important are this one with uh, Moralka, which she did in, in, also in 2004, of New York City, just New York City. And she also did one um, of Chicago, which I don't mention on this page, but I'll mention later. Um, there are three other um, studies just of Michigan, um, uh, is, which I've mentioned by Bettinger and by Ebertson Hollenbeck, and there's a very recent one that was done 
um, and presented, again, uh, economists presented at the Midwest Economic Association last March. I love the, the, the name. It sounds like a, a, a vaudeville group, Israeli and Murphy. Um, they, uh, they are out of Oakland University. They uh, have done a really, really nice study and some interesting uh, insights, which I haven't had a chance to completely digest. Hoxby's national study compares charter schools with the schools that their students would most likely otherwise attend. In other words, she has looked at them geographically, actually, and she had a very fancy GPS-type program, uh, geographical program, uh, where she looked at a charter school and said, okay, what's the nearest public school? And she tried to find, match charter schools with schools, public schools that were in the vicinity and also had the same uh, composition, as close as she could find, with the charter schools. And she showed that, in fact, charter schools are, in the main, superior to public schools. And she, and, and I have my issues with some of the stuff she comes up with. She's predisposed, I should say. Maybe that's unfair, but most of her work is, is um, very solid, but also very much in the corner of charter schools. And she has the horses to back it up. Three states come out as not superior to public schools, and that's us and Texas and North Carolina. The Texas one is actually not statistically significant and kind of right on the border, statistically, not geographically. And Michigan is um, close to being statistically significant. North Carolina is uh, st very statistically significant. Why Michigan? I'm not going to deal at all with Texas or North Carolina. She also showed, and this is the, uh, an interesting uh, piece that I, I'm trying to weave in in my own mind. The two big, big city studies that she did, New York and Chicago, showed that in those city environments, those urban environments, the charter schools did much better than their public counterparts. Um, parenthetically, I'll say that the, the um, the environment, the, 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 the economy of charter schools is very different in these cities. You have a much greater concentration, more competition. And this is somewhere where I'm trying to figure out what, that's all, what that all means. Um, it has also led to some interesting innovation in the schools in large metropolitan areas. And um, I don't see that necessarily in Michigan. That's just a parenthetical remark. The ebertson Hollenbeck study, uh, which was just about Michigan, validated what, Ho what Hoxby said, yep, there are 0.3 standard deviations behind the publics. Bettinger, who was in a separate study in entirely, also found them uh, two-tenths of a standard deviation behind. Um, the um, Israeli and Murphy um, study, which I um, have, as I say, I've just started get digesting. I, it came into me after I had done my sabbatical, and so I haven't had a chance to spend as much time on it as I'd like. Um, the, the one fact that comes out of this, there's lots of other stuff in there, but one of the things that I think is important to note, and, and again, I'm trying to figure out what this all means, about half of the, half of the charter students come from public schools, from private schools. Um, and I think that's an important fact. Again, I'm not quite sure what it means. I think it has to do with the composition of students. It certainly has to do with the, it, it, it explains to a certain extent uh, not surprisingly, the decline in private schools. You have a choice as a parent between a private school where you pay a lot of tuition and a, 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 a public school, a charter school, which looks a lot like, in terms of governance and some other ways, like your private school, and it's free. That's, that's, that's a choice many parents have to make and have made in the direction of charter schools. So about 50% of the charter school students in, in their study, they have, dis, they have discerned, have come from um, private schools. Glenn? The implication is that in most other cases, it's a lower number. It's what? A lower number. What is? The percent of students who come from private schools. What do you mean, a lower, lower than what? That, you mean other states? Yes. I don't know that. I, I have no idea. So that might not be and, 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 and that's something I have not had a chance. That's a wonderful, thank you. That, that's something I should try to find out. 
Um, and I'm sure someone has examined that, and Hawksby may have, and I just haven't gone back and looked at that. That kind of came on my radar when I read the Israeli and Murphy paper and said, oh, wow, this is, this, this is something that I have to note, and I, I'm still um, digesting it. Um, that would be, um, it could be a statistical explanation for why Michigan is, is falling, is behind what the other, the charters in Michigan are behind, but I don't know what the mechanism would be that I would use to explain that, but yeah, I, that's something to look at. All right, we're going to measure performance in charter schools, and um, the, the, this is what I'm going to study, what I have studied in this, I started to look at uh, when I started the study, as we all do, you know, the much broader. Look at all the grades. This is three through eight. I, de I decided to leave out high school because, in fact, high school is a slam dunk sort of a, uh, a comparison. The charter high schools fall way behind. They're, they aren't even close to the public schools, uh, which, uh, and, the, and the only bright light for the charter high schools is that as they get more experience, as they, they get older, they get better. There's a very strong correlation between how many years they've been in business and how well they do. But the new ones, it's not a pretty sight. And I don't know why. I, I just said that's not, I, I have to choose. So I chose the three through eight. So we're looking at the MEEP score, the Michigan Educational Assessment Program. And I'm not going to, as I said before, look at the flaws in that test. Um, there are two sections to it, uh, English language arts and math. We are going to compare schools using that, but I have a real fundamental problem with that, and I've been fiddling around with a, with a statistical uh, tool to try to s satisfy myself with my concerns, and that is to look at the input into these schools. Some schools have kids who, are, who come from backgrounds where they are um, exposed to lots of books, lots of education, they have uh, all the advantages, and some kids on the other end of the spectrum don't have all those. And so I looked, one of the numbers that always shows up with MEEP scores is in fact the, per, the percentage of students in a school that are eligible for the free and reduced lunch program. So we are, I am going to normalize it. Hoxby used, as I mentioned before, a completely different uh, way of adjusting for the, shall we call it from an economist's point of view, the raw material input into the schools. And she tried to find, um, she tried to compare schools with their nearby neighbors that had the same racial and um, income uh, distributions as the, as the charter schools, the public schools nearby. Um, Ebertson Hollenbeck uh, had a different data set and they looked for they, they looked at consecutive years to see how students did. Um, I'm using this different normalization, which is look, looking at the um, later on. I'm not doing it quite yet. Hold your horses. Um, I know you're getting excited and you're waiting for it. But um, this, I'm, what I first did is to validate, in a sense, what Hoxby had done uh, with the whole nation. And I did it with the data I had uh, with Michigan. And so I compared charter schools with the, 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 the public schools in their same district. And it was, they had some, again, Department of Education um, was very nice and provided that data in just the form I needed it. I did uh, what are called, for those of you statistics people, I see a couple of the math department people here. I can talk, talk, math talk. Um, these are what are called pairwise t-tests. You compare the pairs, you look at district one charter school against public school, district two charter school against public school. The difference, look at the, the overall differences and see if the, the differences are statistically significant. Um, the, um, in, in all cases, uh, in, 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 I keep pointing, I pointed the screen, that's stupid. Um, the, the English language arts um, number, the charter schools, are 3.76 percent behind. The measures we have are percent of students who are uh, who pass the get a pass. I think it's acceptable or better on the MEEP test. 
And the other number is the percent of students who are eligible for the free and reduced lunch program. So those are the two numbers I'm going to be using throughout this, uh, this, this uh, presentation. So in the case of the English language arts, um, they're almost four percent, charters are almost 4% behind uh, comparing them with their similar districts. We're not even using free and reduced lunch here, by the way. We're just looking, saying, okay, how does the charter compare with the, near, the nearest, well, the, the, the public schools in their district? And they're almost 4% behind. Math, they're almost 3% behind. The P underneath there, for those of you who aren't math geeks, um, are a measure of statistical significance. And the lower it is, the more significant it is. The number we typically use in, in uh, statistics is 0.05. If it's below 0.05, if P is less than 0.05, we uh, declare that it's statistically significant. There's a, when it's P is 0.04, there's a 1 in 25 chance that this, could ha this difference could happen um, randomly. That, that in fact they're equal, but uh, somehow the, the sample had, had enough variability in it and it could happen one out of 25 times, 0 0.4, 4%. The uh, math is more statistically significant as 0 0.003, which is very significant. 0 0.01 is about as far as we ever go, and this is below that, which means it's very statistically significant. And the question would be then, um, are the district's schools, the public schools, different than, or are the charters different than the, the district, the in-district public schools, in their poverty measure, poverty um, numbers at least. And the difference, if you were going to explain these negative numbers in the, in the, in the uh, test scores, you'd have to have a positive number. That is, the charters have more poor kids than the public schools, but in fact they have fewer. And, but the, the other side of it is the p-value is much too high to be statistically significant, so you just ignore it. So we go back to the original numbers, and you say they are different. This validates what Hoxby has done using a, a rough approximation of what she has done and what some other researchers have done. Then we go to um, uh, a comparison that, the, and this is a, a mystery to me still, the Department of Education report that I got all these data from um, made the same comparison as I did, but they only used the 20 districts that have three or more charter schools in them. And they came up with the conclusion that the charter schools were better. Now, I, I, this is something I, I admit, and I, I'm a little embarrassed, I have not examined in any detail. I haven't run the numbers again to see if I come up with the same result. But um, uh, uh, that's one of my to-do, it's on my to-do list. Um, it may be uh, some sort of a, an indication of where to go with this. It may be that, in fact, in larger urban and more competitive areas, you, in fact, run into uh, more comp competition and better performance from charter schools. That's, that's a possibility. That's just a speculation right now. Now, here goes the other one. Roger, and you're going to have to talk loud because I have... Do we know what those 20 school districts are and where they are? Do we know what... The I do, but I don't have them. The 20 that, 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 the, that the state did, I could look them up, yeah. They're the big ones. They, they, are, they aren't always the big ones because charter schools sometimes land in odd areas. You have, uh, and you do in fact have the anomaly around here. You have, uh, for example, some of the National Heritage Schools um, are out in non-Grand Rapids public areas. Uh, there's one out in, um, uh, well, there's one out on, on uh, the, the NAP charter out there. Draws a lot from, um, Kentwood and places like that, but not necessarily uh, from the forest. I think they're actually in Forest Hills. So I, 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 they're either Forest Hills or Kentwood. And then uh, there's one in Walker that mostly draws from uh, the, the public, Grand Rapids public. And they're in Walker. So I mean, that, that wouldn't show up on that particular measure. So yeah, there, there are some anomalies here where uh, I'd have to look at the individual districts to see what they were doing. Yeah. Good question. Um, so I'm using the relationship between poverty and uh, performance as my alliterative um, uh, title alluded to. Um, and so I'm going to use, uh, for the rest of this study, 
this way of making a comparison between schools. In other words, we're going to look at a school saying, okay, let's look at how well you did on the MEEP exam, but let's normalize it according to how many poor kids you have. So I, I looked at correlations to see if this was a strong relationship between uh, poverty and performance. And this is, these are my results. The correlation coefficient, R, uh, you're learning more statistics than you want, I know, um, is what the, it, it is the sign that we want, which is negative. More poor kids, poor, you know, lower scores. And it is um, not as high as I'd like it. Point, it. It can get as high as minus 0.1, which would be a perfect relationship. Uh, or, you know, a, a, a high, the highest possible correlation. But it is statistically significant. It is the p-value, again, comes up at us. It is less than minus, uh, less than, I'm sorry, less than 0 0.001. Can't be minus. It's a probability. It's less than 0 0.001, which is very statistically significant. Therefore, yep, there is a relationship in the direction we had expected between the uh, the performance scores and the poverty scores. So that, that's the first thing. Then we go and um, there's this is the, 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 the statistical uh, that there is an inverse relationship and in English schools with more poor kids do worse than those with fewer poor kids, which many people would say, duh, and it's true. I mean, you expect that relationship. It's not surprising, but what I'm going to do is formalize it with a regression equation which tells me what this relationship looks like in mathematical terms. And so what we can do is calculate a predicted value for your MEEP score based on how many poor kids you have in the school, which is what I'm going to do. So we, we normalize the test scores and we look, this is sort of analogous to a mean. If you're above the average, you're doing great. If you're below the average, you're not doing as well. When I show you the regression line in a minute, the schools that are above that regression line, at least in my measure, are doing well or better, whatever you want to say. They're doing better than expected, perhaps, and the ones below are not doing as well. And, yes? Yeah, the dependent, dependent variable. What? The dependent variable is the mean score. Correct. That's the proficiency. Here it is, right here. Here's, here's the regression equation for the English language arts exam, and it's... Um, they, this is a description of the line. Uh, it predicts that if you had no, no poor kids, you'd have, a, you'd have 94.6% of the kids passing the exam. That's that 94.6. And for every additional percent of poor kids you have of free and reduced lunch, uh, for every additional percent of those you have, we predict that your meet percent acceptable scores will go down by 0.44%. So every 1%, you get about a half a percent down. And the R squared, which is the uh, coefficient of determination, uh, is a measure of how well this fits is 52%. We can explain about half of the variations in MEEP scores by variations in the, um, the, the poverty measure, the free and reduced lunches. This is for the English language arts. And here's the picture, pretty picture. Color, ooh, it's so great. Um, this is uh, the blue line, you, which you can barely see because you've got so many schools, is the regression line. This one's slightly different because the one that I showed you before is weighted, and you can't do weights on the picture. But I wanted to give you the picture to see things. There's nothing like visual uh, to, to figure out if there's strange things happening. We do have a little out, few outliers down at the bottom right there. Um, those I've got an explanation for. But I'm not going to go into that right now. So this is the English language arts. Here is the math, same, same drill. <clears throat> the, the regression line looks almost the same. Uh, the parameters are about the same, the statistics 95.3 and 0.422. In other words, if you had no poor kids, you'd, you would predict, you would estimate that you'd have 95% of your students passing the MEEP. If you, and for every additional percent of poor kids, your percent pass rate goes down on average 0.42%. The R squared's a little lower here, it's uh, 0.39. We can explain about 40% of the variation in the um, MEEP scores by variations in free and reduced lunch. And here's the picture again, same thing, looks very much the same. 
uh, some outliers, but uh, a, a, a verifiable variation. So let's look at a school. I'm going to look at two schools real quickly. Uh, you may be f familiar with both of them. We plug their free and reduced lunch number into this equation, and we say, what should you be doing according to these numbers? Um, what do we predict statewide? And so we compare with the actual versus the predicted, and we find out the difference. If it's positive, you're doing great. If it's negative, you're not up with the Joneses. Here's a school right down the street on Fuller, William C. Abney Academy. Um, interesting school, um, marvelous principal. Really, uh, it's right down on Fuller, uh, right across from the, uh, the home and the, the uh, parking lot for the church. Um, there, you can see their free and reduced lunch is very high. 80, almost 90% of the kids are eligible. Their predicted performance on the ELA is 55%. That's what we would expect. Um, they actually came in at 67.5%, which means that they're 12.5% above what is predicted. They're beating the, the odds, in a sense. In math, it's even better. They, um, we, we would predict 57.5% pass rate for them, and they're actually getting 82.2%, and they're 24.7% above what we would predict. So they're doing great. Even though, if you look at their proficiency, 67 and a half and 82, there are lots of schools around here that do better. The, the Forest Hills schools and East Grand Rapids and schools like that are way above that. But how many poor kids do they have there? We, we would, if we ran a prediction on them, they may actually be below what is predicted. I haven't done that for those schools. Then here's another one. This one's affiliated with Aquinas. So I thought, well, that's cool. I'll do that. Maybe this is why the education people didn't show up. Um, the uh, they have 58.6% of free and reduced lunches. Their predicted proficiency, you can see there, their actual proficiency. So in English language arts, they come in substantially below what would be predicted. In math, they come in just a little bit above. So they're kind of a mixed, mixed bag. And uh, that, that we can do that for individual. I could do that for any school, just plugging in the numbers. Kind of fun to do if you wanted to. Um, these are the only two I did. I don't, it's not that much fun. So what I want to do then is to go further and predict the, uh, is to compare charter schools and public schools the, same, the way that uh, Hoxby and others have done, uh, only using a different tool. And so what I use is something called a dummy variable, which is simply coding uh, charter schools with a number one, coding public schools zero, I won't go into any further than that, but there will be a, the number will be spit out, the regression coefficient, which tells you what it means to be a charter school or what, the, what being a charter school does to your MEEP percent, given a certain level of free and reduced lunch. So, da -da -dum, da -dum. Um, this is the number for English language arts, and the last number there, minus 3.42, tells us that for a given level of free and reduced lunches, being a charter school nets you 3.5% fewer, you know, fewer um, pass, uh, a lower pass rate by 3.42%. I can say it right after a couple of tries. And the, so it shows that the charters are in fact not performing as well as the public schools with English language arts. Normalizing for free and reduced lunches, but, but uh, and holding that constant. So, they're lower. For math, it's about the same thing, only the number's a little bigger. Yes, what happened? Oh, I'm sorry. I think it is Grand Rapids Public, but I'd have to check on the question was, what's the relationship? Um, is, is Grand Rapids Public holds the charter? They're the authorizer, but we are we run it in a sense that we are trying out a uh, Re Reggio Emilia, Reggio Emilio um, um, uh, type of education program, uh, which is uh, somewhat different and innovative and all that stuff. Yeah, that's.
I'm going to get on to showing, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to distinguish that. I think, I think I'm going to answer your question. I'll see. So here we go. We're comparing charters and publics statewide. And they, in the math, they come out below also, the, the statewide. Now, let's look at, I think this is where we're going. Um, this is the conclusion. Um, the normalized measure shows that grades three through eight public schools are performing better than their charter counterparts. The publics are doing better than the charters. The charters are not doing as well. And the regression coefficients, the numbers I came up with are statistically significant. Again, here we go, authorizers. Is that where you were going? So if there are four types of authorizers, community colleges, intermediate school districts, a local educational authority, I think it's called. They're very much like ISDs, um, and, I, and I'm not sure I know the difference. Uh, and there are, there's only one community college, three, uh, eight ISDs, uh, three LEAs, and eight public universities. And if you lump them together, you, you look at their performance, um, the community college comes in about Eight, eight, seven to nine percent below the public schools. The intermediate school districts come in a whopping 20 to 25 percent below public schools. The local education authorities come in nine to 10 percent below, and the public universities come in about four percent below. Note that most of the schools, the, it looks like it should, the, our average numbers should be higher. But in fact, what it is is that the, there are 158 of the 233, and the vast majority of the students, if you looked at the student balance, the vast majority of the students are in charter schools chartered by public universities. And um, that's why the, the, the numbers come out this way. But they're about 3 to 4 percent below. Okay? Then you go on to um, just taking all the public university authorizers, breaking that down. These are, the, these are the schools that authorizes Central, Eastern, Ferris, Grand Valley, uh, Lake Superior, Northern, Oakland, and um, Saginaw Valley. I, I, knew I'd, I knew I'd blow one of these. should have written them in. And those are the schools that authorize. Um, the class champ on this one is actually Grand Valley, which is around 4% above. So their charter schools are actually coming in higher than the others. And again, this is one of the things that I haven't had a chance to pursue, but I think it's an interesting result that for some reason Grand Valley is doing things and coming in. Now, I don't know whether it's that they are doing things better, whether they're choosing their students better, whatever it is, they are, they are coming in above. Um, the ones that are doing quite poorly are Ferris, uh, is doing kind of the bottom of the bottom, and uh, northern Michigan is not doing well either. And uh, there could be a lot of reasons for that, which I'm not going to go into, but it's, it's again, a, a question. Yes? Are the management companies uh, geographically like the management companies? Yeah, and, and one of the things, that the, the next is, is, in fact, the management, the management, uh, authorities and and that's something I haven't explored either and that's that's one of the questions I have what's the geographic composition what are the urban and, and suburban and rural compositions of these actually the Israeli and Murphy paper starts to deal with that and I haven't had a chance to digest that but yeah that's that's an excellent uh, perception because it is something one of the surprising things is that um, the community college which is way up in uh, uh, the UP has them all over the state. Uh, it's really a weird sort of phenomenon. And I think they have kind of a carte blanche to do whatever the hell they want. Um, it's, it's tribal, tribal law for I know. Yeah, yeah and, and they, so they, they, are, they are not bound by the same strictures as the other schools. And there is a limit. And they are allowed to, I think the limit's actually 200 charter schools. And uh, Bay Mills is the reason they're more than 200, because they've jumped into the fray. Um, the uh, educational service providers, this, is this, this answers some of your question, I think. Uh, you can look here, again, the, the one that's doing best, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to me, was National Heritage, a, a for-profit organization. Uh, I guess as an economist, I should cheer for capitalism or something like that. The market works. 
I don't know. Um, they are doing better. Again, I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at this in any detail to see why it might be that, uh, that National Heritage is, is doing better, um, but they, you can see that the other ones are not doing nearly as well. They're all on the negative side for, for every exam, for every, every category, and, they, and National Heritage is positive. So I found that one of those, one of those mysteries that uh, I s have yet to figure out. And one of the questions I raise is, well, could special ed be the, the issue? Maybe they, because a lot of, um, there are charter schools that cater primarily to special education students, but in fact, um, are charters serving a higher percentage? And the answer is no. Um, this is a little hard to read. This one I stole from the state report I would clean it up later on, but it's, if you look at it, they are below. If you look at the, the, the uh, learning disabled special ed, um, they are 3.9%. The all publics is 5.3, and the um, host districts from which they are, uh, or in which they are, are uh, 6.2. I think the key to this is the non-LD special ed, which are the more expensive special education students, the more challenging students typically, um, the differences are greater. They're almost, the host districts have virtually twice as much high a percentage of special ed kids as the charter schools in them. So there's, there is some, they have been accused, and I think rightly so, of doing their best to deflect students who have special education issues. Um, there's good evidence for that, and they have been taken to the mat on that by the state, and they have claimed they've cleaned up their act on that, because it, initially they just basically said, oh, your child has uh, special education needs, oh, we can't help you. And they still do that some, I think. Uh, some of the uh, national heritage is the one that's been accused of it a lot. So that, that's an explanation of something. And then um, here's another, here's just a chart that's the same thing for that graph that I had before. Finally, summary. Charters for special education to start with. Charter schools have lower percentage of special ed students and they are, these differences are statistically significant. Bingo, we're gonna go fast because we're getting out of time. Well, not, not too bad. Um, charter schools, again, as I said, they, they go after, they seem to have the, a large percentage of the less expensive uh, special education students. The two categories, learning disabled, which is kids who have uh, normal to ab above normal intelligence, but a particular disability like dyslexia or something like that, and speech and language impaired are the least expensive students to accommodate. When you start talking about um, emotionally impaired, autistically impaired, um, lots of other categories are much more expensive and the charter schools have done a pretty good job of deflecting those or at least they haven't uh, absorbed them into their populations. And I think it's particularly the school, the charter schools that are run by for-profits. Um, they, they, we need to look at that more carefully. That's one of my research uh, goals. Finally, the conclusions of the paper. Um, it confirms what other people had said, whoopee doo. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's worthwhile to do the exercise using a different lens, and that's what I've done. So going back to Glenn's statement, it, in a sense, it isn't good policy in the sense that they don't provide a superior alternative. That doesn't mean to say that a, that a, that a parent whose child could be looking at a really awful public school might not um, see a benefit and perhaps realistically see a benefit in a charter school that does better for a variety of reasons. So on an individual basis, uh, you could end up with a better solution for your kids. But oh, as, as a broad measure, not so. Um, there are wide variations among the individual schools, authorizers and educational service providers, the man management organizations. and. One of my agendas on this is to, to work with this tool of normalizing um, performance by poverty because I get really upset when I see schools that are just full of poor kids getting hammered by the po politicians and everybody else for doing poorly. Well, my gracious, they are dealing with challenges that the teachers in Forest Hills and East Grand Rapids and even East Kentwood never have to deal with. 
and um, they're, they are, they're not going to do as well. And so why not use something that actually accom accommodate isn't the right word, normalizes, adjusts for what the kids are. Don't, don't slam the teachers. They're doing, actually in many cases, a hell of a good job. Look at what they are doing in terms of those kids. It's sort of like looking at inputs and outputs, again, like an economist is wont to do. Finally, um, further research, um, I want to do better with ed special education. It came in uh, to me uh, a little late in the game, and I didn't get a chance to run regressions on it. I'm sure you're devastated. Um, the, the, uh, I want to put that into the regression equations. And finally, I want to ask the question, why are they below? I, I, going back, several of you have, have headed toward that question, and that was one of my original questions, and I really have uh, only speculation at this point. I have some ideas about urban-rural, about competition, those sorts of things, the kinds of things that an economist would look at, especially at the help of a geographer. And um, he, uh, I, I, I know there, are, there is something to what has gone on in, in New York. For example, in New York City, the public, the uh, charter schools are enormously innovative. Lots of it, one of the things that Hawksby did was to look at a lot of these innovations. You know, they're trying uh, tough love, they're trying uniforms, they're trying different school days. But the one that, that makes a difference, the one that she found statistically improved performance, length of the school year. There is well-known it is well known in the literature that poor kids, kids with disadvantages economically and culturally, um, can do as well as the other kids in school. It's that summer vacation that just crushes them. They go off and they don't have the kinds of advantages that, the other kid, that many of the other kids do, and they fall off the table academically. And, and so it's going up and doing well, and bingo, the summer comes, and then you've got to catch up again. And the, the kids with the advantages don't have that drop off. So that's something that she has found, that the, the length of the school year makes a big difference. And there's some of that going on in Michigan, where they have extended programs in some of the charter schools. So they're moving in that direction. That's as far as I've gotten on this, and I uh, hope to maybe I'll tell you about it again in a year or two. So thank you very much. <clears throat> any, any questions lingering around that you'd like to ask? Um, Mike. <laughs>